All right, so thanks, Sabrina, for the, for the introduction. So yeah, today I'm going to talk to you guys about how to build a galaxy, or at least how to learn uh, about how to build a galaxy with this new graph neural network-based uh, architecture that, that I've made. And this is in, in collaboration with a lot of people at, uh, at Princeton and, uh, and the CTA. Um, just to mention it, yeah, my name is Christian. I'm a grad student at Princeton. Um, but uh, let's get into it. So today I'm just going to be talking about first what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Just, you know, what is it actually that, that I want to know? Then I am going to give a very short introduction to one of my favorite topics, which is graphs and graph neural networks. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to go over some results that we get from, from using this kind of stuff in, uh, to learn galaxy physics. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the, the, the cool stuff that's come out of doing this initial, initial project um, uh, to end up with. All right. So, What's the issue? Well, the issue to me and to a lot of you is that galaxies are these big and bright and wonderful things, but they're also very diverse and very, very complex. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we want to know about them that's really, really complicated to figure out. Um, the things, the kind of stuff we want to know is, you know, like what are the building blocks of galaxies? You know, what are the, what are the fundamental things that we make galaxies out of? We want to know what are the um, mechanisms that put those building blocks together um, and exactly how do those building blocks that get put together by those mechanisms. And so in many ways, um, the, uh, like building a galaxy is a lot like if you went to Ikea and bought a cabinet, um, and in, in your box you got some, uh, some instructions on, like you have, this is, like these are the things you got in your box, and these are the tools you need to put it together, and this is the way you need to put it together. Um, and so the thing we really want to know is, you know, like, uh, so the thing we, we usually focus on in, in, uh, in physics, when we you know go to IKEA and buy our galaxy, um, is the is the building blocks um, and the tools that we get. And the building blocks tend to be something like you know a, a lot of stars and a, a big dark matter halo. There might be some gas, there might be some dust, all kinds of fun stuff. And then the only tool we really need to put it all together is gravity. Ta-da! All right, so now we're done. No, well we're still missing something from our IKEA catalog, and that is the assembly manual. Like, how do we actually put this together over time? And so that's what I want to focus on. And the, are these steps over time on, like, how do we actually uh, put these things, how do we actually put a galaxy together given our stars and our dark matter halo and our gas and all that? And why do we think this is important? Well, you know, Martin and Fiske and a lot of other people have already talked about, you know, mergers and galaxy evolution and everybody kind of knows that it's important. But just to kind of go over it uh, shortly, we know that, you know, when we run our dark matter only simulations, or hydro simulations, then you know stuff forms hierarchically, and it matters a lot to the galaxies um, um, within these halos uh, how that halo evolves. Like, does it have a lot of major mergers? Does it does it evolve in isolation? And the way that we usually encode this kind of evolution in astrophysics is through this thing called the merger tree. And uh, I I love these merger trees. Uh, I think they're fantastic. Um, essentially, the, the, the way to uh, read one of these merger trees is just that at some time in our simulation, we, we stopped the simulation, took a snapshot, and we found all the halos in, you know, in that snapshot. We ran it forward a little bit again, took another snapshot, found all the halos, and then we just connect everything that ended up like merging or not merging to like, you know, its, its progenitors. And so in that sense, we just have a, a tree that connects progenitors and descendants to each other. And so um, this is... a uh, this is a really cool structure, but this is just for, uh, for dark matter only, only simulations to begin with. And so if we want to get actual galaxies out of this, we can, you know, run a semi-analytic model on top. And we've already heard a lot of talk about this, so I'm not going to dwell too much on exactly what that is. Um, but essentially we, we just, you know, co, like co-evolve a lot of the baryonic properties of galaxies on top of this merger tree. We can, of course, also just bite the bullet and just like run a full hydrosim, but that takes a little bit longer. Um, and so, in general, you know, like for, for a lot of purposes, um, we just use the, the semi-analytic model. There are some problems with both approaches, though. Um, we usually think about SAMs as being fast, but that's only because they're fast compared to hydro simulations. Uh, <laughs> SAMs actually still take t take a lot of time to run, and so if you want to run them on a, on a really large cosmological box, you're still looking at, at tens of thousands of CPU hours spent on that. Again, you know, it's not you know running TNT on a gigaparsec box but it still takes time. And there's also the problem that both of these approaches might have something on physical in them. And that's really only a problem because they're very hard to analyze. Like if I, if I tweak something small, 
and my entire simulation changes, it can be very hard to pinpoint exactly what was it that, like, what, what cascade was it that led to, to that change in my final galaxies. Um, and so in order to get something that's both faster and has a new way of, uh, or had, opens up a new window of analyzing our simulations and our SAMs, you know, let's go build an emulator. And I kind of spoiled what I'm going to do in the overview. Um, I'm going to, of course, smack some machine learning on top of this. Um, and, <laughs> and I'm by no means the first person to try to do this. And a lot of the people who've done this before are in the room. We have Natalie and, and Chris, uh, who both tried to, like, build emulators of, of this, like, you know, dark matter to galaxy connection. Um, but these approaches tend to focus on, on the first two steps of my IKEA manual, which are the building blocks and the things keeping it together, and leave out the, the assembly manual. And so the thing that I really, I really want to focus on is the assembly manual encoded in the merger tree. Part of why this has been left out before is because that, that introduces another level of complexity, that, like a much increased level of complexity, because you need to figure out a way to present your, your merger tree to, to, your, to a neural network in a way that is, it's actually possible to, to figure out something, uh, something from that. And of course, again, for those who have been here for the last two weeks, you know what I'm going to talk about now. Um, because merger trees are graphs. Um, and it's, when I say a graph, what do I really mean? Well, I just mean like a set of, of nodes or points connected by a set of edges. And it's really obvious when you look at a, at a merger tree that this is, is something that you can easily abstract as a graph. And because there's been a lot of advances within the last couple of years with graph neural networks, that means that we can put our merger trees as graphs into graph neural networks in order to do this learning task of how galaxies evolve uh, um, on merger trees. So the nice thing about, uh, like about encoding this as a graph is that we, we get to obey some nice physical principles about how galaxies are supposed to evolve. Essentially, the structure of the graph encodes the causality of how the halos in, uh, evolve. It, you know, obeys principles like locality, that only things, like, that actually, like, you know, that actually influence the halo at a given, given time step is connected to that halo. So, you know, for example, you know, in here, like, the, the two things, you know, the two halos that came right before this halo here are connected to it and can influence it and, you know, can actually pass information to that halo, whereas this halo over here does not have any influence over it at all. And th this is the structure, well, only later. Uh, <laughs> And this is, and this is uh, simply a, a structure that just embeds this principle of, of locality and, you know, and, and a sense of direction of time. And so, well, so now we have our graphs cool. What do the graph neural networks then really learn? Like, what, when, I, when I do my learning task, what do I actually want to learn? Well, I want to learn some kind of function that passes information from you know, a given node um, to, to another node. And it's called message passing. It's, it's, it's a pretty simple function in, in, in that sense. And so in the merger tree, that really translates to a function that passes some information forward in time. Essentially, the progenitor, ha the progenitor halos will pass some little packet of information forward in time to, to a given halo saying, this is how you looked in the past. And then, you know, the, the, the halo at the future time step will use that information to update, update uh, its state or its current state of knowledge about itself. And so, um, so, you know, we do a lot of, you know, hyperparameter tuning and architecture optimization. We make a, uh, a graph neural network architecture that we ended up calling Mangrove. And we made this, this logo that I spent way too long on. Um, and, uh, and so what do we get for all our trouble? Well, we get some really, really uh, good reconstruction of uh, central galaxy quantities like stellar mass. On this plot, what you see here is, you know, the, the uh, uh, gal uh, galaxy mass or stellar mass um, predict, as predicted by a SAM, and then what uh, the GNN, or Mangrove, uh, predicts on the y-axis here. And you can see this relationship here is super duper tight. Like, we're really, we're really nailing down the, the, the stellar mass of these galaxies. And we, the scatter of this relationship is about 0.07 dex. And that's actually really impressive when you compare it with um, the intrinsic scatter of the standard crew SAM that we're using to, to produce our training data. Um, because if you just change the random seat of the, uh, uh, of the Santa Cruz SAM and then run the whole thing again, then uh, this, this relationship here between like one run of the SAM and another run of the SAM would have a scatter of about 0.05 dex. And so we're really reproducing like the, the, you know, the underlying model to within its own accuracy, like within its own ability to, uh, to approximate itself. Um, and so that, that's really cool. All right, but, you know, and if you, if you try to compare this to something like, you know, like abundance matching, 
you can kind of pretty easily see the the immediate advantage advantage of this that this offers. But as you could say, like this might be an unfair comparison because you know like abundance matching is is, is quite a simple method and I'm using a, a you know a model with like 400,000 parameters and so you know maybe 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 if we just compare it to to the approach you know used in the literature where we just regress from from the features of the final halo to the galaxy that would be a fairer comparison. And there the scatter the, the scatter is about 0.13 dex, so about uh, so so about uh, twice as uncertain as as when you use the murder, the murder tree. Um, and so this tells us something about how much extra information is there about the stellar mass of a galaxy in the formation history of that galaxy. Um, there are there are parameters in the in the final halo that encode some information about uh, about the, uh, the the formation of that halo. And so it's not like you know there's no formation history in the in the final halo features. But this is like the specific geomet this is the the boost you get from the specific geometric structure of that uh, like of that murder tree. And so really just like with you you really follow follow the instructions carefully on your manual. Um, you do get a, a pretty significant uh, improvement. Another way of looking at this is just to like try to do the eye test and look at the like the M halo M star relationship, because a lot of um, not a lot of neural networks tend to struggle with reproducing the the scatter in this relationship. And I think Rachel talked about this a couple of weeks ago for the people who were here during the workshop. That when we want to when we look at what our scaling relationships, we don't just want to reproduce uh, like the mean scaling relationship. We also want some some way of encoding. How broad is that 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 relationship, and like, can we can we get individual points to lie above or below that in a principled manner? And we can see that like when we do this with the and, and the reason why no, normal neural networks struggle with this is because they're they're you know by by construction they're meant to regress to the mean, and so they 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 really like start out with finding these uh, these um, mean relationships, and they don't really get to they don't really push uh, the, the the scatter of that uh, of, of that relation out. Um, and so that's that's really nice, and we can even try to look at some of the very extreme outliers, the things that you know have like you know have almost nothing to do with this like scaling relationship, which I'm really excited about, which is these the, the, these three points here, which lie like super duper far above the the M halo M star uh, relationship, and we get those like dead on. And so when I saw this first, I was like, all right, cool. Now we we, we must have really captured something about like the underlying model here, and we really learned learned the physics that the that Santa Cruz Sam embeds really well. Um, and so, you can also ask, okay, cool, this is like this is a lot of stellar mass stuff, and you know I focus on that because it's a pretty central parameter to get right for a lot of galaxies. But can you do other stuff? And like, yeah, we can do like essentially anything that the SAM outputs, and we can put it all in the same models. So we can do cold gas mass, the metallicity of the of the cold gas, star formation rates averaged over different time scales, and and black hole masses, and all of these are significantly better. Than if you just do regression from the from the halo halo features to the galaxy features, and so that's really nice. Um, and so just to kind of like sum up, like midway through, when you when you go down and buy your galaxy, your favorite galaxy in IKEA, be it a spiral or an elliptical or whatever whatever you know you like, yes, like you know all the original things, all the all the original building blocks and all the original tools are still the same, but you do need to follow the the assembly manual, otherwise your galaxy will end up looking kind of crooked. But then you can ask, okay, cool. So I need to follow the, the assembly manual. Are all the steps really that important? Um, you might be lazy like me and like you know inclined to like you know skip some steps in the manual and like not like following directions, stuff like that. Um, and um, and ask like, well, like, are they being a little bit over careful? And the way to ask the questions about merger trees is to say, well, how much of the merger tree can I cut away before I start losing information about my galaxy in the end? And so the way we do this in, in, in uh, for mangrove is just like try, try to trim down the murder tree from high redshift towards low redshift. And what we observe is actually that you can trim uh, basically the first 50 uh, 50 percent of the murder history away without losing uh, losing any statistically significant reconstruction power. And so this is actually a really uh, like fun statement that like a galaxy simply like doesn't really remember the first 50 percent of its murder history. And on the other end, when you get really close to like redshift zero, where we are predicting the, the galaxy properties, you can see that the importance of each individual like halo that we cut away goes up exponentially. Because it goes up exponentially, we can interpret this in a really nice fashion as a Lyapunov time scale for um, for how much each halo at a given redshift uh, influences the uh, the galaxy in a halo at redshift zero. And so in that way, it becomes a time scale for uh, for how long uh, for a time scale for uh, that embeds like on the, the time scale 
on which galaxies are chaotic. And that's a really, that's a really cool science, like, you know, science interpretation of this. All right, cool. So now we're starting to look into like, you know, a little bit more, you know, scientific questions, not just like emulating. And this is the kind of stuff that, that I, I'm actually the most excited about. Like, where does the information come from and different things? And like, what is, what has my network really learned? So now we can ask, you know, what else can we do? And something that I've been working on a little bit is trying to do this uh, symbolic regression task, which is essentially trying to, this uh, package that Miles Kramer at uh, Princeton, now CCA, has, has written that tries to fit um, analytical expressions um, to, like, you know, some input-output data. And it's really useful for getting a, an analytical approximation to what a neural network has learned. And so if we try to do this for, you know, the stellar mass in mangrove, we get this, you know, really, pretty then like condensed relationship out. This isn't all there is, like there is a drop in performance. You know, like you go up to like about like 0 0.13, 0 0.14 decks again, so you start losing, losing a lot of reconstructive power, like you can't condense all galaxy formation down to this. But it is, it is nonetheless still a nice interpretable equation. So what we have here is that, you know, the stellar mass um, for, you know, at redshift zero is equal to like, you know, a weighting factor times some sum over all the halos in the merger trees times some, you know, expression. All right, so now we can try to think about what could this expression actually mean? Well, it has to be some kind of star formation rate. Because if I, you know, take a sum over all the halos in my merger tree, weighted by how many stars they're forming, or, you know, what's the mass of the star that they, they formed at, at that given epoch, then, you know, then I must get my, you know, total stellar mass out in the end. So that has to be what this encodes. And the cool thing about this is that it's based only on Vmax. So it's just like a one feature, like, equation. And it's a pretty simple one. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll get to, get to see this in the paper soon. Um, there's of course also the, que the, like, the question that like, hey, like you're maybe cheating a little bit because like the semi-analytic model like you know uses the merger tree to find a, a solution. So aren't you kind of embedding by hand that you should be able to do this task? And like kinda, I, I would say like it's still really interesting, but yes, kinda. So let's try to do this on you know hydro. And f for that, we I've been working with a student at Taiwan, Chen Yu Chuang. Uh, who's been uh, trying to throw this at um, at at, Illustri at TNG 300, and he's also getting really really good results out. He's not just uh, doing you know predictions for redshift zero um, um, galaxies or you know like a, at a given redshift. He's trying to do predictions for every halo along the merger tree, like every epoch along the merger tree, and so he's getting some really really uh, really cool results. Again, that also improves significantly uh, over this like you know like you know, like just like halo to galaxy mapping. So again, confirming this thing, like you need to follow your assembly manual. If you if you just try to like put together your things on your own, to smack all the building blocks in your IKEA box together, you will get a wrong galaxy out in the end. Um, but there's also no reason to like stop at, at you know galaxy properties. Like I'm I'm especially interested in in mapping from from dark matter to galaxies. But galaxies aren't the only things that are that are impacted uh, by formation history. So uh, you know dark matter halos. And so while I've been here, you know I've started this project with with Martin Ray and, and Chitske to look at, you know, how much is concentration affected by the exact, uh, the halo concentration affected by the exact merger history. Like how much, how much information do you leave out when you condense down different parts of the merger tree? And so what we have tried to do is simply just, you know, to take, uh, take our ability, take mangrove and just say like, what is our abil ability to predict concentration of a final halo given only the main progenitor branch of the merger tree? So, so just the branch uh, where um, where the, like the most massive halo is, or if you do like the full murder tree, and it seems like there's about you lose about 20% of the information when you throw uh, throw away the rest of the rest of the murder tree. Um, but this is again very preliminary results, so you know like this, this like the exact numbers might change, but it's just like a way of like demonstrating what kind of questions can you ask with this kind of like you know architecture where you do these ablation studies where you have a model train or something and you try to like take away some, some bit of information just to see like what is the impact of not having that, that, that amount of information. All right, cool. So what did we learn today? Cool. When you use a, a GNN or something like Mangrove um, to predict galaxy physics uh, on like, you know, to predict galaxy properties, you get a better and you get a more robust emulator. You know, it captures outliers, it captures the mean scaling relationships. It can do essentially whatever, whatever it is you want it to do. Um, and it still, you know, it still still maintains the, the speed characteristic of of you know normal machine learning alg algorithms. So it's still five orders of magnitude faster than than than, than a SAM, and you know ten orders of magnitude faster than Lustrous, which is you know always nice. Um, but most importantly, and this is the thing that I care, care the most about, 
it gives you a really strong and really versatile way of analyzing the dependence of different, you know, you know, galaxy or halo parameters on merger history. Um, and you can also, you know, use it and just apply it to both like, you know, dark matter and galaxies to learn something about the physics that drive either. Um, of course, all the code is public, uh, so just go to my GitHub, you can just find it. Um, and if this has inspired any project ideas, please come talk to me. And if it's not about, you know, galaxies, it's just about graphs or GNNs, please do come find me as well. And uh, yeah, now I'll take questions, I guess. Lots of questions. Um, <laughs> right at the back here. Hi, uh, this is Jingwen. Um, really great talk. Um, I kind of have like one and a half questions. So could you um, go a little bit into details what kind of graph neural network you use? And like the other question will be, um, so there's like some graph neural network allows you to learn the weight between like the weight, the edge weight. Um, and looking to in the edge way, you can also kind of like see the relation between each of the halos. And you don't, yeah, so like, uh, have you look into those kind of network? And like, what does the edge weight tell you in those case if you have done so? No, so yeah, that's a, no, it's a great question. So the, the, uh, the exact um, layer that we use is this graph stage convolutional layer. Essentially, we don't get a, 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 an, an improvement from using an attentional layer. Like it could be a really, and I, I agree, it's a, it's a really nice question. It could be a fun fun way of um, of figuring out like you know like how a given like information from a given node is weighted. But because like this is partially uh, a project aimed at like you know providing uh, an emulator for doing like cosmological sims, um, we went with the uh, with, with something that's faster and, and trains better. Um, but again, like if you want to just you know again download download all the code, change out the convolutional layer. It's a one line change. Uh, and then you can ch you can check it out yourself. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, Helen John speaking here. So uh, my question is actually about uh, your statement about like uh, you can throw away part of your uh, merger history and still get good predictions for galaxy mm -hmm. properties. So specifically, you mentioned that you can throw away about like 50% of it. Yeah. So um, this is quite technical, but like. How exactly are you like uh, measuring this? Like 50%? Is it like 50% of the snapshots, or 50% of the like in terms of the cosmic time, or something? No, no, that's a yeah, and you can define that in, in many different ways. So yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really good question. We just take like the 50% highest redshift halos and f and cut those out. Um, you could also you know have picked like a specific redshift, uh, you know, specific formation time, you know. You know, there, there's a lot of ways of looking at, there's a lot of ways of kind of like changing this question a little bit. Um, and we just kind of like pick one and I have, you know, the main reason being that different uh, murder trees start being detected at different times. And so if you, if you, like if you have something with like a very low mass galaxy, the first like halos that end up making, making that up might only start being detected by the halo finder around redshift of five. And so if I, you know, so in, if I, if I just set like a fixed redshift and cut everything, you know, above that, then some merger trees will not be affected at all, whereas some merger trees will be very affected. And so this is kind of a, a way of just like getting at like the average information content in, in how much of the of the merger tree there is. But you could definitely also ask ask the question in in, in the other ways that you that you you asked about. So the, uh, so this definition depends on like at which redshift you are, right? Because I mean, um, say at redshift ten or like. Uh, for a merger tree that ends at ratio five, you just cut off the first, like the top 50%. Yep. Um, same thing for uh, a merger tree that ends at ratio zero. Yes, okay. all the merger trees that I've talked about here, um, we, we have done a lot of stuff with merger trees that, you know, that in a higher redshift, that's all in the paper, but couldn't fit it all into 20 minutes. Um, and um, so this, this was all just for like redshift zero uh, galaxies. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, so I have a, a Risa Wexler, uh, really nice talk. Um, I have a basic question first. I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're actually doing. The thing that you're learning is one SAM with one set of physics parameters. Is that right? Yes. So you're not in any way exploring the parameter space in the SAM. No. Um, I, no, I, I'm very, very happy, happy you asked that, actually. It's a, it's a, <laughs> so there's another student at Columbia, Sochiro Hattori, was actually been working on like training the same architecture, but where you can condition it on 
different SAM parameters because you can you can you can train it like for very for many different like so this is just for the for the SC SAM but with like where you run it with different parameters you train it at you know with that set of like input parameters and then you can like for free get everything in between and so it's a really okay. so it's a really it's a really cool way of kind of you know learning because that's how I think of emulators as emulating some sort of parameter space yeah no in no the model and, I mean this is also interesting it's yeah. just yeah. No, no, and if, if you want Good. to use it for, for doing for doing parameter exploration in that way, you can definitely do that as well. Um, it again, um, yeah. Okay, happy to talk to you about that more. And then just one quick comment on the last project you mentioned, which sounds interesting. Um, I just want to point you to a paper if you haven't read it by uh, that was led by uh, Lucia Lucy Smith th that I was involved in that looked at which features were most important for setting the profile. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, I haven't actually read the paper, but she gave she gave a talk about it at Princeton. Uh, so so I, I I'm aware, and uh, yeah, I think I think Martin is officially leading this, and I'm, I'm sure he's aware of that as well. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it's Dalia. Um, Risa stole one of my questions, so I'll ask only one question. Um, I didn't understand, perhaps I missed it, what exactly do the edges represent? Is there information moving there? Is this thing uh, trained on? So is there any weight? So what, what are the edges between the nodes? Okay. So the edges in the, in the current way that we have it do not have any like edge features. The edges are only there to encode the relationship between different halos in the merger tree. So it's just, you know, like if I have a, you know, a halo I found here, uh, and it just evolves by itself, it doesn't merge with anything, and then it's, you know, at the next time snap, uh, like the, at the next snapshot, then we connect them. And then like it merges with a halo over here, and then it becomes, you know, one big halo, and then we connect, you know, that halo, this halo and that halo, so you know the resulting you know descendant halo, and so it is just kind of like it is just encoding the time evolution of the the halos. There are no features on it, so it's just, it's just you know the the grid on which information can travel. I see. So in your GNN, this is simply like a block connecting yeah. two nodes. Exactly. Uh, can it be generalized? It can be generalized, yes. Um, but when we when we're looking at this, we didn't find that it, it you know it made a big difference for how we. Um, for the predictions we got out in the end, whether or not we we, we changed it to be a little, a little bit more general, um, and so we just didn't. Okay, I'll come and okay. find you sure. later. Hey, yeah, it's super cool, uh, Toby Brown. Um, so I was interested in that result where you had like a galaxy doesn't care about fifty percent of its merger history. Sure, that's cool. Um, <laughs> Thanks, I think so too. I, I, I'm wondering <laughs> if that. Um, is that dependent on like the merger types it has experienced? Like if it's a load of minor mergers versus like one just massive merger? Um, I am, I'm fairly certain that it will be. I, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know. But that, but this is a very broad blanket statement. Yeah. Uh, just about like, you know, like, like, you know, across like 110,000 merger trees in this, in this right. set. So we, we didn't go in and look at like individual, individual mergers. I think for that, then, then the thing you do is something a little bit along the lines of what Tree was talking about, where you, you want to go in and, and use this like attentional mechanism and say, well, what thing is actually weighted very highly? The um, one way you can get at, at it is actually from the um, from this analytic equation uh, and say like, well, so if you get a very high v max as a function of a major merger, then that will be weighted highly, you know, regardless of where you are. But because v maxes tend to be smaller in general uh, earlier in the universe. Then this doesn't matter as much. Right. Oh yeah, that would be really cool to do. I think yeah. a really great result. Cool. Hi, um, Elise. Uh, yeah, really cool talk. Um, I just had a question, kind of from my own intuition. So sure. for the TNG result, is that like should I think about that as you just are taking your merger tree and like running your SAM on top of it? That's what your graph neural network no, 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 is no. doing, or is there something? Yeah. What's well, what's happening beyond that? Yeah. So so for for the illustrious example, we're taking merger trees from the uh, dark matter only illustrious run, run and that are matched to the like full full physics uh, TNG run and we are trying from the dark matter only merger trees to predict the properties of the uh, of the galaxies in the in the full physics run um, across you know all time it has nothing to do with the sam at this point there's no 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 sam involved it's just the same architecture uh, so we're retraining it retraining it to fit 
TNG. I guess though, like if you did just run your SAM on the dark matter only, like how different would it be from your prediction from your? Um, that's a good, uh, good, uh, good question. Um, and I don't think it, I don't think you need to do this with a GNN. This has been explored, you know, like what are the differences between the Santa Cruz SAM and Illustrious? There's a paper by Austin Gabriel Pillai um, that, that kind of explores this, uh, this question. But you know, I'd be, I'd be happy, to, happy to try it out for you. <laughs> you know, like you have the model lying around, so I'd be happy to try it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please come find me afterwards and ask me more questions. Um, have you characterized how much volume you need to train the model so that you can predict all environments? I'm not sure I completely understand uh, understand your question. Is this is this for specifically for the TNG or, or the SAM? It doesn't really matter. I I mean the let let me let me specify my sure. question further. So let's imagine I wanted to apply this to 10 to the 15 solar mass halos. Sure. Um, how, how many do I need? Do I need to fully probe all of the environments? You know, even if I'm thinking about lower mass objects, you know, what if I only had a five megaparsec box and I trained my 10 to the 11 solar mass halos in a five megaparsec box? Probably that wouldn't work if I then try to apply those to the trees that are um, one megaparsec outside sure. of a 10 to the 15 solar mass halo. So I'm just wondering if you sure. thought about that. No, um, we have, and it, no, it's a, it's, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question as well. Um, it's actually one of the, one of the things where this kind of machine learning is, is really, like, really offers a, a leg up on most other things, um, because the, because merger trees are self-similar, um, you can actually kind of like re, because the merger trees are self-similar, um, you can actually kind of cast this like general like general algorithm or general like you know galaxy formation model that you've learned uh, pretty easily into like you know very high mass gal galaxies partly because when you when you uh, not high mass galaxies high mass halos partly because the um, when you like you know the merger feed that you learn for like you know like a 10 to the you know 12 halo is uh, essentially the same thing as like you know like two like 10 to the like uh, five times 10 to the 11 what? Yeah, the galaxies. Sorry, I'm very confused by that. We we can talk about it sure. over the break, but but I mean the trees are self roughly self similar, the but the galaxy similar. formation physics is definitely not. No, <laughs> no, I, I I wasn't I wasn't claiming that the that the galaxies in themselves are self similar. Um, they you know that's kind of my my initial my initial point that like galaxies are very complicated. They don't they don't have like you know this these like nice self similarity things. But because like the the underlying thing that you're that you're you know using has some like nice regular structure, that means that like the general rules that you learn for how to evolve galaxies on top of that regular stru structure is easier to extrapolate than if you're just going from like you know low mass halo regime to like a high mass halo regime. Um, but maybe I can try to try, try to like draw it out uh, on the backboard afterwards. I think that's all we have time for. Sure. Definitely come find our speakers later <laughs> if you have further questions. And with that, let's give all of our speakers one last round of applause. <laughs>